Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have uh, an exciting and wonderful episode today. We have Lindsay Fauntleroy. You may not have heard that name, but you will be hearing that name. Lindsay wrote this amazing book. It's not even really a book. It's a manifesto. It's uh, an amazing book that is going to be coming out in August. I had the wonderful opportunity and was really grateful to read this book prior to talking to Lindsay. This book is a game changer. It has a lot of information that you may not have heard. Uh, there, there's so much for it and there's so much to it. If you haven't heard of Lindsay Fontlory, Lindsay is an acupuncturist and founder of Oceans and Rivers. She's also a certified instructor for the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine and a faculty member of a new possibility. Her three-year practitioner certification program is the first program to be authorized in the Flower Essence Society in the United States. And her amazing book, which I will have a link, you can pre-order a copy in our element, using the five elements as soul medicine to unleash your personal power. As somebody that loves to read these kinds of books and loves to read you know, different spiritual books, this had so much new information. And I really learned a lot uh, what Lindsay is teaching is an elemental medicine, a way of understanding the elements and integrating it into your spiritual philosophy. It's got illustrations in it, and it's representative, and it has a certain cultural flavor. It comes from Lindsay's personality. I learned so much from it, and I was so excited to get a chance to talk to her about it. So welcome to the Reality Revolution, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me. I am beyond excited to be here. Well, obviously you were inspired to do this and you tell a little bit of your story in the book. So let's, let's share your story with everybody that's watching. What inspired you to write this book and tell us a little bit more of your journey here and, and a, a more about yourself. Absolutely. So I can start if I go back to the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, what really introduced me to working with plant medicine in this way, working with the five elements, which I talk a lot about in the book, was my own journey to fertility. And so I was in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with what they called then premature ovarian failure, they don't use that that phrase anymore. Um, but I was told that I could never have children. And that was really devastating for me. And in that process, I was introduced to flower essences. And so my sister-in-law had this cabinet of Bach flower remedies, which some people may have heard of. And she just, you know, she was looking at me and I was on the couch and I was crying and I was going through every single emotion you could possibly imagine. And she just started putting these little tinctures in a glass of water for me. And it really was a game changer. It really supported me in aligning my heart and my soul and all the emotions that I was going through with a higher truth of the possibility to heal. And in that process, the, the flower essences were a catalyst for me in introducing me to acupuncture and getting to really know a different type of medicine um, that moved beyond what I was hearing from my doctors, what I was reading on the internet. And it really started to shift and help me to say, okay, if my body is energy, my body can change. And if my body can change, then what else can I change? You know, and that was really the beginning of an exploration of how to work with the five elements, how to work with the energies of the earth to create the, the lives that we want. Yeah, it's an amazing perspective and there's so much information. I, I really don't know where to begin. So um, what, what you do in this book is you break down the different five elements and, and these chapters are long. You have, you have musical playlists um, with some really cool stuff, great re musical recommendations, flower essences related to each one. And you have a lot of perspectives about the elements um, that I had not really considered. So tell us a little bit more. Um, maybe we can go through some of these different elements and how they relate to our lives and how sure. it might empower us a little bit. Um, first of all, how do we find out more about how elements are uniquely affecting us specifically? 
Well, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that we all have all of the elements. You know, in some different traditions of acupuncture theory, they might help you to find your what they call the constitutional element. But what I like to say is, you know, just like the year, there's different seasons in the year and there's different seasons and phases in our lives. And so in the book, I walk you through a little bit of an assessment to say, okay, which one of these elements is really up for me right now? Which one of these forces, these archetypal forces has a message for me, has healing for me, and is available to me to transform my life. So it's really thinking about, okay, I am starting a business. That's a very wood element kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tap into the gifts of the wood element to help me start my business. If I'm parenting, um, you know, the earth element talks about the nurturing qualities. um, And we see the fruit, you know, the fruit is the phase that represents the the nurturing qualities of the of the seasons. And so I'm going to tap into the tools for the earth element to help me with my parenting or to help me nurture a relationship. So it's really like being a bit of a magician and and pulling in all of the different energies and elements um, to support our manifestation. So in in, in unique in the perspective that you're talking about, um, let's back up your education, you kind of had a a focus on archetypes. So I wanted to talk, I see a relationship with this in in my own study of archetypes. Mm -hmm. And as you study more, it, it becomes like this deep part of our spiritual personality and our growth. So talk, let, let's lay the foundation and, and what your knowledge of archetypes has led you to and how it sort of creates the foundation for this. It's really thinking about these, each of these elements as archetypal forces. And so my relationship with all, with the archetypes kind of comes from a few different places. I began my study uh, working with an uh, acupuncturist named Lori Deshar, who wrote a book called Five Spirits. And in studying and training with her, she really taught a lot about the archetypal forces through the lens of um, Jungian depth psychology. Mm -hmm. So thinking about these archetypal energies and the way that they live in our psyche, uh, fast forward a few few years, and I really got deeper into my study of African spiritual systems. And African spiritual systems are inherently archetypal. They um, are often thought of as being polytheistic, but really what we're looking at with African spirituality is the naming of different archetypes, different archetypal forces that are thought to be representations of the divine. And each of these archetypal forces comes with it, you know, body associations, thought associations, personality associations, not unlike we see in astrology or other archetypal sciences or the tarot. Um, And so as I started working with the elements and thinking of the elements as, you know, gatekeepers of archways of archetypes that bring us into these different paradigms, uh, that's how this work has landed in me. And it's really exciting as I talk to um, others about different archetypal systems, we start to see where these, these primal forces really align with one another. You know, we can look at the wood element, we can see evidence of like an Aries kind of energy from astrology. We can see that warrior energy if we were looking at more of a depth psychology. And then we can see Ogun, which is the warrior of the African pantheon. And they start to dance together and weave together because ultimately at the end of the day, we're talking about expressions of the human psyche. And so different cultures at different times have maybe labeled these, these forces of the psyche differently, but ultimately we are, we're talking about humanity and how humanity moves through this, this timeline. Now, I knew that I, I was reading my soul sister when I was reading this because you had the story at the beginning and I've talked about it on my podcast. I had this amazing experience where the trees started talking to me. Um, and you have this story where you, this, this poisonous tree says, oh, you know, I'm poisonous. And, and you have some other stories, like you had to go get permission from the tree. So please tell me about your experience talking to the trees. <laughs> oh, that's, it's my absolute favorite thing. And so in the, in the book, I talk about the story of being in West Africa and Ghana with what my martial arts teacher at the time. And, you know, I'm sitting under this tree and it's beautiful. And I'm kind of in this reverie, this daydream of marveling at the tree. And I just hear this little voice that says, you know, I'm poison, right? 
you know I'm poison, right? It was a very sultry kind of voice. Right. And then, you know, a few minutes later, the my teacher comes out and says, that tree is poisonous. Get out from under there. What are you doing? And that's really how nature talks to us, right? It's not so much um, listening with our ears and, and mm. imagining that a tree is talking in a language that a human would use, but it is really shifting our consciousness and shifting our psyche to a, a state of consciousness where we can receive from nonverbal realms and that we can kind of listen with an intuitive heart. So when I'm doing my classes and my trainings, that's part of the training is how do we get out of an analytical mind? How do we get out of our logical mind? How do we get out of our rational mind that is really rooted in the five senses and the material world? That worldview, that consciousness is not going to support humanity at evolving to the next level. So we have to go back and relearn and remember uh, the ways that our ancients, the ways that our ancestors communicated with the natural world, which was through slowing down and shifting our consciousness to be able to perceive this other type of communication from the natural world. Now, and so, you, oh, go ahead. No, no, go, yeah. Um, you, you found that they, 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 they're not all the same. There's some that are grumpy. There's some that are bossy. There's some that are super inquisitive. They all have their own personality, right? They do. I always say nature knows and plants are like people. Right. And so we do this exercise out here in the New York City area. We'll go to the Botanic Garden and we'll walk through the garden and you can feel how the trees maybe have more stature and more of a protective energy. And then you go to the garden, the rose garden, and they're all like very chipper, vibrant, personable flowers. But it's a feeling and that connection to nature's personalities is what we're bringing into our psyche when we're working with flower essences. We're calling in this natural intelligence of the natural world which means that we have to humble ourselves to realize that the natural world has an intelligence. Now, it's not just trees. We can, all of nature can communicate with us when we open ourselves to it, right? That's correct. All of nature, all of nature is, is communicating to us. And that's, that's a pretty ancient concept, right? The, mm. I call it neo-ancient, but uh, there's a concept called the anima mundi, which is a concept that is out of antiquity. You can see evidence of it with the Greeks and, um, and ancient Kemet. And this idea that there is a shared pulse, that there's a life force, that there's an energetic field that we're all connected to. And so it's really attuning our senses to be able to perceive that current and that energy and that, that consciousness. It's amazing. So let's talk about some of these elements. So um, you, you break it down and you have um, some lessons that we can learn with these different um, elements. Um, so um, help, help the, the listeners kind of learn a little bit about this. When we come uh, to the water element, let's start with that. Um, uh, um, what are the dynamics and things I need to be aware of? How can I utilize this element and, and, and enhance it? What flower essences, that kind of stuff with, with water? Tell me a little sure. more. Sure. So the easiest way to think about these elements is to think about what we already know, which is the cycle of the seasons. Right. So if we use that as a metaphor, we think about the water element as being the winter season. So what happens in the winter, at least out here in the Northeast, is that it gets really cold, it gets really contracted, and everyone just kind of wants to stay inside and bundle up and mm -hmm. sleep. And, you know, it's dark outside, we're moving into the winter solstice. And so when we're in a water element phase, it's how do I come into that place of quiet and reflection and solitude? It's a very introverted phase. It's a place of wanting to learn how to trust my intuition. And so the flower essences that we would look at for that time are going to be flower essences that support us in slowing down, flower essences that support us in taking a break and creating an oasis so that we're away from the noise and away from the busyness of our lives. It's almost like being a seed that's being incubated deep mm -hmm. beneath the earth and going into that, that quiet, listening to our dreams, dream journaling, and that sort of thing. And so um, then we mo move to the wood element and you had some interesting um, things, even, you know, on, on a basis of justice, as I remember mm -hmm. for reading through that chapter and, and I, and I related to that. So um, what, how can we utilize this wood element? What does it mean? And, and what are the essences we can use for that? So with the wood element, we're looking at that next stage of that seed cracking through the soil out of the winter and, and coming into the sun 
in the spring. It's the spring season. And what I like to think about with this, with the wood element is a sprout that is pushing against the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. So if gravity can hold a 10 ton multi weighted building here on the on the earth and the sprout can go against that force of gravity that's a huge tremendous amount of force so we say that the wood element governs our ability to push up and push against the force of gravity and as that relates to social justice it's the ability to individuate and push against whatever is holding us down whatever is holding us back whatever is keeping us from reaching for the sun and so the flower essences for the wood element are gonna really support us in using our voices as agents of change, um, being able to assert ourselves as agents of change, being able to live fully into our purpose, to go after what we want, to go after our dream, to go after our vision. That's what the wood element is going to help us do. And so the flower essences for the wood element are gonna help us to lift that force within ourselves against the things that are holding us back and push forward. And, and sometimes to do that, we need anger. We need anger as that force to push through and make change. So anger equals change is one of the lessons we learned from the wood element, taking a stand, empowering yourself, right? That's right. That's right. Um, and we talk about the difference between reacting and responding. So our reaction is going to be the yelling, the screaming, the crying in my case, um, when I get angry, but it's really the response to injustice that creates the change. So we can have our reactions, we can have our protests, but then there's the part of the wood element that teaches us how to strategize and say, okay, what is the wrong that's being done and how do we take corrective action in addition to whatever we might be feeling or emoting as a response to the anger? Now, you also show the meridians that are related to the element and yoga poses. Um, some okay. of these are, are not complicated, but helpful in bringing that element out, correct? That's right. And when I think about yoga, I think about just taking one pose and just doing one pose. Sometimes when we think about yoga, we're thinking about doing a whole 60 right. minute thing <laughs> and building up your whole day. You can do that and that's fine. And that's why I have the playlist. If you want to rock out for 90 minutes thinking about the wood element, have at it. I've got your back. But really, it's just sitting in the quiet and stretching that one meridian, that one channel, that one river of consciousness um, and holding that position and seeing what comes up from the inside that our bodies really know and that our bodies hold this information for us, that when we slow down enough and breathe into it, it can emerge and make itself evident for us. Now, with the flower essences, it's almost like magic. It's almost like you're magically bringing about this element. Correct. That's, correct. That, that's, that's right. the best way I'm getting it. So, so we move to the fire element um, and you get the idea that we're whole. We, we open our hearts that, you know, joy has juice. I love that. And your senses are <laughs> sacred. T tell us a little more about what the fire element means and how, how, how we bring that about. So the fire element coming out of the sprout, the next phase in the plant life and in the human psyche is the flowering and the blossoming. And when we think about a field of flowers, there's just joy, there's color, it's vibrant, it's soaking in the sun. And so the fire element teaches us how to do those things. How are we enjoying our lives? You know, it really honors that, you know, we were sent down here, we have a mission, we have a purpose, and we're also meant to enjoy being here. We're meant to love one another. We're meant to be here in harmony and in celebration of life itself. And so the fire element is to awaken that joy. It's to awaken that connection with our human family. The fire element teaches us about love and relationships and how do we form connections and how do we maintain our sense of wholeness when those relationships end, right? right. It's that coming together and coming apart, but maintaining our integrity. That's what the fire element teaches us. It keeps us connected to our inner spark of divinity. It keeps us connected to our essential wholeness and our essential integrity as we move in and out of relationships in the human family. Now, as an artist, I kind of found like, if I want to um, bring about my artistic um, inspiration, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to bring about that fire element, right? That's right. The fire element can help to awaken that sense of wonder and inspiration. And really, how do we bring in the beauty of life into what mm -hmm. we create? You know, it's seeing our art as a, a celebration 
of life and a, and a communication of the, the best that life has to offer and the messages of the divine. So we move to the earth element and that's honoring the mother, the find your, finding your center, your body's a temple, right? So tell me more about you know, how we can use that and what that can do for us. So the earth element is the fruit of the plant life, and it teaches us how to nurture something that is coming out of the ethers and into manifested form. So the ma the mother is like an archetype. It's this idea of, you know, every child begins as a thought, and then it goes to this process of being nurtured and incubated until it's ready to come into the world. And so the earth element teaches us how to do that with humans, but also with our creative ideas, with our business plans, with anything it is that we start with an idea and want to bring into earth, including our bodies, it's recognizing that our bodies are the manifestation of a divine idea, right? And so the earth element is teaching us how to, um, how to nurture that, how to stay centered, how to stay grounded, and to really come down onto this planet and feel the grass under our feet and our toes digging into the soil and how to be practical with the big ideas that we have. You know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is if you have an idea and the earth element has it spinning and spinning and spinning around, but you never actually take action, then the earth element is going to come in and say, okay, how do we make this real and practical and grounded so that it can show up on earth and not just live in your mind? So for the people um, listening, the idea is if you want to create your reality, and it's, it still seems like an idea in your mind, you want to embrace that earth element and bring that into your life because it that helps to solidify the thought into an actual thing, right? That's correct. That's correct. So we move to the metal element, which is to be present, that you're precious, and to let it go. Uh, it, it, a little bit different element, but also very important. And tell me how... You, we can utilize the metal element in our lives. So the metal element, I, I think, is one of a huge, just socially, an element that is really present for a lot of humanity right now. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the metal element deals with what happens when that apple from the earth falls to the ground and dissipates into the soil. So it's the composting, it's the dissolution, it's the dissolving of matter into something transcendent. And so the metal element is teaching us about the transcendent nature of our souls. It's teaching us about what is beyond the physical. And so there's an opportunity with the metal element. It's often associated with religion and spirituality and spiritual practice. It's also associated with death. It's associated with grief and loss as we come to terms with what's temporal and what's eternal and, and how do we hold on once something has you know, past its time. And, you know, there's been so much grief within the collective over the past few years um, between the COVID pandemic, wars, violence, so much grief for humanity. And yet with the metal element, we learn that within our grief, there's something transcendent that's, that's emerging. And so it's, you know, equal and opposite force. And I think, you know, even including a lot of the work that you do in terms of shifting our consciousness and really being able to step beyond the physical is really what the metal element teaches us. How do we honor that there is an aspect of us that is not just weighted in matter? And how do we step into that, honor that, and, and channel that when we need to? Right. So I'd love to get your perspective of like, you know, old occult teachings like Manly P. Hall, when they talk about the elementals and the, the, mm -hmm. the spirits of water and air, air mm -hmm. and fire and, 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 you know, that they're actual living, you know, like kingdoms of these elements. And, mm -hmm. and some of that's, you know, myths from archetypes and some of that mm -hmm. maybe is, has some reality to it. So um, tell me what your feeling is about, you know, the personification of elementals as living spirits that are a part of the, of, of the spiritual milieu, if that makes sense. You know, I think that it's, you know, when we look back through different cultures and different times, I, one of the things that we talk about in our, in our classes is that, you know, everyone is indigenous to somewhere. Everyone has people that were indigenous to somewhere. And all of those people had a relationship with the natural world. How those relationships evolved and showed up in different cultures, you know, it's, it's you know, they show up differently. 
Um, one of my teachers, Patricia Kaminsky of the Flower Essence Society, talks very specifically about, you know, flower essences as being um, a way to tap into and communicate with, you know, these elemental forces, right? Right. Um, sometimes people call them fairies and things like that. Right. And then in other traditions, um, they are seen as metaphors for the psyche, you know, and so I've seen both sides. And I think what I've what I've settled into is that use what is practical, use what works and supports you in elevating your consciousness, whether you think that these are actual elemental spirits or whether this is a metaphor for your psyche and how you transform your psyche. I think both work, um, but it's really about getting grounded into a system that is going to support you in being a better human and treating the planet better, treating your fellow humans better and elevating your consciousness. So we'll have a link in the description. You definitely want to pre-order this. There's so much more that we barely have covered, but I want to go further and just talk a little bit more. It's always exciting to talk to an acupuncturist. Um, I'm super fascinated by certain meridians and I've done some episodes. I want to get, I want, while I have you, I wanted to get your perspective um, doing research on the assemblage point. And John Whale talked about the assemblage point, Carlos mm -hmm. Castaneda, Vadim Zeeland with reality transurfing. There's mm -hmm. this, this energy that's sort of in the middle of our back that's connected to our heart that may have a role or play in our reality and, and how we, um, you know, I, I wanted to know if you've studied that. I, I, even my acupuncturist here, you know, I've, I've asked um, and there's different opinions about it. Do you know what I'm talking about? And do you have any opinions about that? Uh, well, when I hear assemblage point, I hear meeting points, uh, and I'm not sure that we're talking about the same right. thing, so I want to make sure. So an, an energy point that is basically in the middle of our back between our shoulders. Um, uh, it's, some schools say that there's an energy like cord that um, sort of invisible that detaches from the back of our head, and we, and, and, and we can kind of feel it where it comes mm -hmm. to a point in the back, in our back, um, mm -hmm. but it also may be connected to the energies of our heart pulling through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have uh, um, um, so somebody I interviewed that said that she can see it when, when she's massaging a back, she can sort of see a focal point of energy in the back. I've also talked to some acupuncturists that say, no, I don't, I don't think there, there's anything to that. I haven't really noticed that. So there's mm -hmm. like two schools. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was wondering if maybe you knew what, what, where this is coming from. I don't, I mean, well, one thing that I'll say about acupuncture, which I think is fascinating in terms of the history of acupuncture, of acupuncture is that it has migrated and changed so much. Um, I haven't, this, the school of thought that you're talking about in terms of this assemblage point is not something that I'm familiar with. Right. However, I wouldn't, what I will say is that, you know, on the back, there are the move points, what we call the move points. Um, and there are some points right in between the shoulder blades that are directly meant to touch to the heart, you mm -hmm. know? And so I can see how, I could see if someone's attention and consciousness is attuned to that point that it would amplify and that they would be able to perceive that if that's what they're focusing on and looking for. You know, when I think about the meridians, I do think a lot about quantum physics and I do think a lot about how our intention, we're, we're essentially the meridians are light, right? right. And so our intention, um, what we're looking for, what we're palpating for as practitioners does influence what we see and what resonates with us and what responds to us. We are energy beings and the meridians are energy and responding accordingly. So even though I haven't, um, I haven't come across that field of study, I can right. see how it would be valid and a place to continue exploring. I wouldn't, I wouldn't no, discount it. I, I wouldn't throw it out. That, I appreciate it. It's, it's an obscure topic. So I appreciate that answer immensely. So uh, t tell me a little bit more. I always like to ask this. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit more of how, how you go about your day. What, when do you wake up? What, what, mm -hmm. what your spiritual practices are? I kind of like to model people that are that have high spiritual you know, consciousness, especially from reading your book. So tell me more about you know, how your general day goes. Do you meditate? What, what do you eat? Tell me a little bit more uh, of what you've come to at this point in your, in your path and how you've integrated it into your daily routine. One of the things that brings me so much peace right now, especially is just walking in nature. 
I like to go out um, first thing in the morning when the sun is coming up. I kind of have my alarm set to whenever the sun is rising and it shifts throughout the year um, to get up and to go outside and to just go for a walk. It is the time of the day that brings me the most peace and the most communion. And I'm walking, I'm praying usually as I walk. Um, I'm asking always questions about what it, you know, what am I here to do? How do I do that more clearly? Um, I ask for messages. Um, I am a Abarisha, which is a student in the Ifa tradition. And so part mm -hmm. of our practice is praying into water, asking um, the universe to bring us what we need. Um, to bring healing for those who need healing. And there's a divination practice within that as well. And so mm -hmm. I ask about, you know, what are the energies of the day? In the book, I talk about uh, the Ifa tradition and I talk about yeah. patterns of light and dark, um, which is similar to the I Ching. And so mm -hmm. I, I do a, a basic reading just to say, okay, what is what are the energies of the day? Um, not in a predictive way, but more as a student and observer to just see, okay, at the end of the day, can I see how that pattern unfolded? Did I see, you know, uh, that there was some anxiety? Did I see that there were some places where I was more emotional? Um, and so that's that's a big part of my practice. Uh, in terms of diet and eating, I do tend to change with the seasons. Now that the summer is here, I'm tending to eat lighter, more raw foods. I'm definitely not a raw foodist. Um, but I do, <laughs> I do yeah. notice that my body starts craving different things as the seasons change. And so I try to, to pay attention to that and, and to not be too harsh with myself with, with what I'm craving and listening to that. Now, the relationship between foods and elements. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. If, is there certain foods that I can, can cut down or increase if I want to bring fire element or, you know, just tell me a little bit about what you found about that. Yeah, so in East Asian medicine, um, dietary uh, diet is a huge part of the medicine. So each of the elements has foods that are associated with it, herbs that are associated with it. And what's mostly easy and practical to implement is that they each have a taste or a flavor that is associated with it. Mm -hmm. So I always say from my folks that want their morning coffee, that's a very fire element thing because fire is a bitter taste. So that's uh, black coffee, that's dark chocolate, that's any food that has that bitter taste, whereas the earth element is more of a sweet taste. So sweet is, of course, honey and things like that, but it's also red meat. You know, beef has in this tradition a sweet taste. Mm -hmm. Dairy has a sweet taste. So as you're working with a particular element, you might bring in those foods that are represented in those colors. You know, the fire element is red, so that would be red mm -hmm. foods. Um, the wood element is green, so that's looking more at green foods and, and really bringing that in. Um, I think all of the different ways that you can, if you're working with an element and you've decided that this element is, has something for you to learn, all of the different ways that you can bring your consciousness to it are going to support you. So that's your diet. That's going to be your exercise or the program or the yoga poses that you choose to do, mm -hmm. the music that you listen to, um, the quality of how you use your voice and your words. All of those things are going to inform that element as it's starting to awaken and, and heal you. Is there a relationship between the elements and, and the energy centers and the chakras? Yes, and, and, definitely. And, okay. Definitely. I would say it's not a one-to-one -one relationship though. One of the mm -hmm. things that I talk about in the book is like not trying to remix them all together um, because they did originate out of different cultures and they do work best when we kind of keep them intact within their own integral system. But I see a lot of overlap, right? Because again, we're talking about the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about the fire element, um, there's a lot of heart energy, a lot of heart chakra energy. When we're talking about the wood element, we're talking about a lot of solar plexus energy, that, that ability to stand in our individuation, that the I am part of our being. When we're talking about the water element, we're talking about the, the root chakra and our sense of survival and our sense of safety and the fears that, that may come from that. Mm -hmm. um, and so also with the wood element, we can look at the throat and how we're using our voice. Because when we look at the meridians in the body, they cross through the chakras, mm -hmm. right? But they do have energetic correspondences that we can use and work with. 
especially if we're layering in yoga practice as well. Super fascinating. So um, we, if I wanted to create a meditation to mm -hmm. bring about all of these elements, is, is it better to focus on I individual elements related to us, personalize it, or is it better to holistically try to bring in all the elements? What, what's a better way for me to start if I want to really integrate your, you know, your teachings into this? I would say one of the, the phrases that I learned from my teacher is that she she guides us through a meditation where you move through all of the truths of each of the elements together. Mm -hmm. So starting with water, she says, water is I am. The wood is I become. The fire is I blossom. The earth is I nurture. And then the metal is I surrender. Uh -huh. And so we can begin by just moving through that cycle of life that we are all of those changes and transformations that we, we are, we become, we exist, we, we grow, we expand, we blossom, we attract, we nurture life and we surrender to life. So that's a great place to start. And then you may notice as you're bringing that cycle in that there's a place that feels stuck, that there's a place that feels alive. There's a place mm -hmm. that feels like it wants a deeper dive or a deeper exploration. And then you go there and, and see what that element has for you. I love that. So as I um, understand it, and as I integrate these understandings, uh, the next question is, how can, I, I'm not wording it the best way, but um, how, how do I add air as an element to this? You know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, that seems like uh, it, it's sort of part of all of them, right? It does. And I think that really speaks to that, that piece around the different elements in different contexts, because there isn't really an air as an element right. you know, in the five element system. I think oftentimes um, we use the, the wind as an element that's associated with wood in East Asian tradition to, to mm -hmm. represent that flexibility. But well, that's I interesting. Think I had a, a, a conversation with trees and I don't mean to interrupt. I'll please come back to that. Yeah, the yeah. Trees told me if, if I feel wind, most times it's, it's them creating the wind so they can move. Mm. And I just love that. So I, I love, keep oh, going. Gosh, bro. that's beautiful. That just made my heart jump a little it bit. It made my heart jump too. I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> what, I, and what I think about of the wind um, and air is that you know, and there's a hexagram about this in the in the I Ching. I think it's the 57th hexagram, if I'm not mistaken. But the wind is the invisible. And we only know yeah. the invisible through the visible, right? So we know that the wind is blowing because we see the trees moving. And so I, I kind of hold that, you know, in the system that is so dynamic, that is almost always changing that that air, that vital force, that that uh, that chi, that prana, that breath is all of is what moves all of this. You know, mm -hmm. all of it is chi, and then the five elements become different manifestations of that breath, of that movement, and of that life force. You you could That's argue that we go through ages of elements, right? Like we're in we're yeah. in the we're in the when the fire age right now, and and it has its own consequence. The, 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 how would you relate to that? Do you, you understand what I'm trying to say? I do. I do. <laughs> I do exactly understand what you're trying to say. And I think that's why the metal is so important for us right now, because the metal is really about dissolving structures, dissolving um, so that something can form new life. And I, there's so much, I think, destruction. I think that there are, there's a thought form that's trying to shift. And that's really mm -hmm. interesting. I'd love to talk a little bit about um, the structures of consciousness with Gene Gebser's work, Please. because I think it really relates to this. Yeah. But this idea that we're moving into a new era and we're, new, we're moving into a new way of being, at least I hope so. And, and in that process, something has to die so that something can be born again. Mm -hmm. And so the metal element is, is holding us in that. And there's resistance, you know, we, we resist death, you know, at all costs, we resist aging, to some extent at all costs. And so the surrender to a higher power, the surrender to the divine is, is something that I really think as an age that humanity is, is struggling with and, and trying to awaken and trying to re re-understand and remember tell me talk a little more then about the structures of consciousness i don't think i've read that um but i love that i so please tell me a little more 
<laughs> it's great. And I'll be totally honest. It didn't make it into the book. Maybe that'll be book right. number two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, Jean, Jean Gebser is a philosopher that talked about the structures of consciousness of humanity. And he, he gives this linear expose. He looks at the arts and the sciences and cultural artifacts um, through it from the beginning of antiquity. And he organizes human consciousness into these five structures. And his premise is that you know we didn't just have a different culture. We actually perceived the world through different faculties of perception. And mm -hmm. so he breaks them into these five structures, the archaic, the magical, the mythical, the mental, and then what he names as the integral. Okay. And so the integral, which is what he says is, is the starting point, I mean, is the is the final point, which is where humanity is going. Integral consciousness is our ability to perceive through all of these other structures at will. And so when we're thinking about the mental, which is what I, I think is falling apart and, and what the metal element is helping us to dissolve is this very binary black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a very uh, scientific, no disrespect to science, um, but it is a, it's a way of thinking that says what, matter, what matters is matter that the only thing that is real is what we can perceive with the five senses. Um, that mental consciousness structure um, is very much concerned with the individual ego and the individual perspective. And I think that's what's changing. I think that's what's dissolving as we, as humans begin to remember how to have a collective mindset and how to be interconnected with one another. You know, all of this stuff that we're talking about, whether it's acupuncture, whether it's flower essences, it's really bringing us back to a place of shared consciousness, that we are in a shared consciousness with the entire universe and the entire cosmos. And so it means that we have to get out of our egos, um, which is what the mental consciousness structure really, really heralds and really exalts. Um, and so when we start talking about the magical and mythical, it's using archetypes. It's like the energies of tarot, the energies of astrology. It's honoring synchronicity. It's honoring coincidence. And that is the, the magical and mythical structures are what we have to come back to and remember in order for these other healing modalities to really be able to have an impact and make a difference in our lives. Um, but so what I what I found from reading your uh, book, and it inspired me because I've talked a lot about uh, different spiritual traditions on my channel. I'm mm -hmm. just, in, you know, an information junkie. And the one thing I realized I don't know enough about is African spiritual traditions. Uh, they've been under reported and discussed by scholars. Mm -hmm. And I just I, I, I want to know, obviously, it's it's a it's a a blind spot for me. So tell me a little bit more. Obviously, you have a, um, some some background in this. Um, what am I missing out on? You know, look, I look at a lot of really great um, teachers that are teaching different spiritual traditions. There, I, I don't see an integration of some of these teachings. And whenever I hear some, some of it's amazing. So mm -hmm. what am I missing out on with that? I think one of the one of the first things is nature based spirituality. Mm -hmm. you know, being able to look at the forces of nature as expressions of the divine. I think that's a huge uh, piece that's missing from um, the dialogue of spirituality. And, you know, even in my studies, oftentimes there'll be classes on like East-West spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I always get a little frustrated because right. I'm like, well, East and West, but, you know, where's the African spirituality? Right. Um, and then also, you know, the, the African spiritual systems, there are a few key concepts that I think are central to humanity right now. One is this idea of I am because we are. So again, coming always back to this interconnected field of energy, this idea that I can't do something to my neighbor without it affecting me and coming back to me, that's very central in African thought. Um, another aspect of African uh, spirituality and thought that I think is really important for this time is um, even our understanding of time. And mm -hmm. so we think about chronological time, chronos, logical, linear time, and it's kind of how we set our clocks and live our lives. But when we're looking from an African mindset, we're thinking about kairos, 
which is the opportune time for something to happen. And I have a great story uh, that really illustrates this point. And this was when I was staying in West Africa and I was staying with the shaman, uh, Baba Ashangi, the late Baba Ashangi. And, you know, we got up that day and he says, okay, we're going to do, today we have a baby naming ceremony to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, what time is the baby naming ceremony? And he says, when everyone gets there. <laughs> And I say, because now, you know, me being young and dumb and ignorant and arrogant, I'm, I'm thinking he doesn't understand the question. So I say, well, what time is everyone going to get there? And he says, when it's time to start. <laughs> so <laughs> this idea of being in tune to when it is the right time for something to happen. And we've all experienced this, you know, these coincidences, these being in the right place at the right time, um, the feeling called to make a right when we thought we were going to make a left, and then we make that right and exactly what we were looking for was right there for us. So that's an aspect of African spirituality. It's being able to be in alignment with these, these coincidences, um, being able to see patterns and signatures in our experience um, as, as expressions of these larger archetypal, um, archetypal blueprints. So what is the difference in, in, their, uh, in the use of meditation and prayer in those systems as related to like Hindu or, you know, even, you know, Western ideas of meditation now, did they meditate in silence or did they have different uh, rituals and procedures? What, how, what was different about how they meditated? It- I think it's yes and, because even when we say African spirituality, we're talking about very right. like, over hundreds of different I mean, African Egypt is included systems. in that, right? So, and Egypt and, and is that, included know, in that. And, and that goes to hermetics and everything, right? Exactly. So in each of those systems, you're going to find different ways of, of prayer, of ritual, of honoring. Uh, one of my favorite botanists, uh, he has in his book, he says that to the African mind, living is a religious act. So everything you do in that, in that worldview, everything that you do is a prayer, everything that you do is an offering. But some of the different ways that meditation shows up is sometimes it's, it's done in silence and stillness. Um, sometimes it's done through drumming and trance. Um, sometimes it's done through different musical chords. We see that a lot in the Kemetic or the Egyptian traditions. Um, so I always say yes and to that question because if everything is a prayer, then everything is also a meditation or opportunity to listen. And again, it's looking for patterns. You know, it's looking for patterns and seeing, okay, well, there's a resonance between the numbers or the animals even that are showing up for me, that they are representations of a divine mind and symbols of a divine mind. So for a lot of listeners, they're going to ask me this question. How can I integrate the understandings of the elements in relationships? Should I look for somebody that has a similar dominant element or can I use the understandings of elements to find greater love or relationships? How can we use what you're teaching when it comes to that? They're all tools for self-awareness. So I will always say in my practice, the two things that bring people to me to work with the elements, to work with this medicine, I always say it's money and honey. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Money and honey. People either show up for their career stuff or for relationships, for love. Uh That's what we're here for. It's so true. So the the elements in that system, I would say it's more about self-awareness. It's using the the elements to see where are the patterns that I'm bringing to relationships that are keeping me from finding love. If I'm bringing too much fire energy, maybe I'm a little all over the place and I need to kind of find a way to calm down and and be centered and still um, and not necessarily looking for a partner in kind of a a way of like, okay, I'm water, so I'm going to find someone who's wood. You know, I, I really don't find that it, it works that way. We can't really plan yeah. it forward. But always these elements are here to help us build our self-awareness. And the way that we know which element to work with is largely through the emotions that we're feeling. So if we're feeling disconnected from love, is it because we're fearful? That's going to bring us into the water element. Is it because we're overgiving? Is it because we're doing the most or doing too much or over empathetic? That's going to bring us to the earth element. Is it because we can't handle loss or grief? That 
is going to bring us to the metal element. So they become an internal system, um, an internal compass for bringing us back to a place of integrity and wholeness. So then let's go to the other um, money and honey, right? Yep. Uh, <laughs> how can I use these teachings to help, you know, gain prosperity? Such a great question. So I think the first thing is looking at the phase. Where am I? Mm -hmm. For example, if we use the example of building a business. Is this business in a seed stage or water element stage where it's, you know, it's still kind of secret, it's still being incubated, it's still being nurtured? Mm -hmm. Or is this business more in a fire stage where I need to be posting every day on social media and getting the word out and really starting to shine and blossom? And so that's how I use the elements in a business coaching sense. It's, it's looking at what is the phase that's represented and then what are the internal blocks that are keeping me from this, this energetic flow of my prosperity. So that's, that's an aspect of African thought is that illness can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be mental, and it can also be circumstantial. So anywhere we're feeling a block is a place where we can move chi and move energy and get things flowing again. And the, the elements point us to the stuck places right. that we need to put a little energetic needle to get things flowing again. So we'll use an example. I, I'm going to start a an, an art website, right? And it's oh, at that it's at that beginning stage. Uh huh. So uh, you know, it's in the water element, right? So I, I know I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be hey, got to check out my website. It's gonna be at that point. We're gonna start promoting the website. I'm gonna have to move from that water element to the earth element. Essentially, it's going to become a thing that's more than just this idea, right? It's so I want to bring in earth energy to 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 the business that I'm at, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but right, from right. what I'm hearing you say, it almost sounds like you're in more of a wood element phase because the wood element phase is where the vision gets really clear. Right. Okay. It's like, where do I want this to go? And how do I bring my authentic creativity, my authentic voice, my authentic vision to this, to this project? And so you may be in the wood element crafting that vision and getting it all clear for a while before you're able and ready right. to share it, which would be more of the fire element phase. So if I'm like a week or, or two weeks away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start um, promoting it. Then yes. I want it. So right before I want to maybe get the flower essences for fire or at that point, do I, uh, that's the creation. It's help me down. What, what flyer, what energies do I want to bring in when I'm at that point where it's time? You know, if the vision's ready, it's time to go, ready. just like your book's going to come in August. I, maybe let's compare your book's coming out in August. Mm -hmm. What energies are you going to bring in on August 7th, right before this comes out to help with your book, right? Same, probably a very similar type of um, question, right? Right. So with the fire element, it's joy. It's celebration. You know, it's getting out of the, the feeling isolated, it's getting out of um, feeling like I want to play small and just being like, it's here, let's celebrate. Everybody look at this great thing that's here. Right. And that's really with the elements. It's, it's where, is this, where is the place where you feel stuck? Where is the place that you feel blocked? Okay. Where is the place that is, you know, all of your energy is moving forward into to making this happen? Where's the part of you that's that's holding back a little bit, and that's the element that we would work with to to bring some harmony so that you can flow into the prosperity that's that's already promised. So that's the thing I take from this is it's a way of it's a system to help describe energies. What, what right. you're teaching us, there's all these very intricate little energies, and sometimes we don't have a way of sort of differentiating them. And this book gives you a really interesting system to differentiate these energies. Uh, you know, we're all about at an age where we can learn to control and manipulate energies. And That's this right. is a really amazing way to differentiate the different kind of energies we're using and moving through and being blocked from, right? That's right. So it's, it's a way to kind of check in and say, I always say that you know, soul medicine, the practices that I talk about in this book, they live between heaven and earth, which is a, is a concept that comes out of East Asian medicine. So we all have the stuff that we're doing for our physical bodies. 
we all have maybe our spiritual paths, but in between those two things, there's a lot of places where we can impact change. We can impact change with our thought body. We can impact change with our emotional body and there's energy and life force there. And so this book is really to teach you how do you work with those places in between your spirit and your body to create the life that you want. And so what I offer is a framework and a system to say, okay, out of all of these energies, where am I and which one can I harness and work with that is already in motion so that I can be in alignment with my destiny, with my Tao, as we would say in East Asian medicine, um, so that I can be a creative force and, and fulfill my mission here. It's an amazing book and there's, it's almost 300 pages. There's so much more that we, we haven't talked about. Like you mentioned, the different bodies, you, you, you draw upon so many different resources. I say this a lot on my channel in recommending books. This is the best book that I've read this year. This is the best book of all the people that have come on. Um, it, 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 your heart and soul went into this book. This, not just somebody that wrote a book just, you know, to promote their whatever. This book came from your heart and you can always tell that when um it, it it's important to you and um you know at first it's it's kind of different than what a lot of these other books so you know stick with it because as you do it gets even more and in, intense and do you understand what i'm saying and, i mean you I have do. a basic introduction so i'm saying stick with this book it has so many resources and i think i'm going to end up going back to this often for different things it's one of those that it's you don't even just read through it page to page and then you're done it's a resource Thank you so much. It's an much. amazing resource. So thank you. Thank you for broadening my knowledge on this topic. I'm excited for the tools that you've given me um, now for a lot of things that I'm going to I commonly go through. Now I have songs I can listen to and flower <laughs> essences. I'm excited. I have more tools in the toolbox. That's basically what you've given us is a you know, different filter to, to look at this stuff, more tools in the toolbox. It's amazing. You can find uh, Lindsay Fontleroy at spiritseed.org where you, um, you, you have teach classes and have a other variety of resources. So check out that website. I'll have that website in the links below. And by the time I'm posting this, it, you can probably pre-order or just order as it's just coming out. Lindsay's right. amazing book. I cannot wait for you guys to, to read it. And thank you so much for coming on. It's thank you so much for having you. me. <laughs> and I can't, I'm so excited to see how this book rolls through and changes things because the world's about to change. Um, yes, because is. this is something new that um, people can really utilize. And as they understand it, it's, um, it's magic. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. <laughs>